Welcome to, oh, it stopped. Ugh, very frustrating. We're supposed right. to remind you to record. It's recording. Please okay. mute your mics. Uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Harassus India meeting in 2022 via Run the World platform. I'm Lou Marinoff. I have the privilege of chairing this very interesting panel on a plethora of topics. We're going to try and address a couple of main things. Uh, the, the topic itself concerns uh, the restriction potentially on airing views that may be contrary to regnant ideologies. Uh, there, there are questions about overwriting histories in order to fit certain narratives. Uh, how do we maintain intellectual freedom and, and what is its importance in the current geopolitical climate? what new philosophical schools are on the rise, if anyone wants to suggest one or two. Um, if we are indeed relaxing ideological restrictions, are there possibly universal solutions in the aftermath of the pandemic and the Ukraine invasion and the quote-unquote new normal zeitgeist? I wonder whether everything is anything will be normal again. Uh, that's, a, that's a challenge to all of you. But without further ado, uh, we'll go alphabetically. We have a very distinguished and, uh, and, and, and very thoughtful panel. So let's go first to, to Richard Barron, philosopher based in the UK. Richard, would you like to begin with the earlier uh, set of topics uh, pertaining to speech and perhaps the importance of free speech? Go ahead. Sorry, me? Yes, Richard. Hello, hello. So, yes. Sorry, there was a bit of a problem with the sound connection. Yes, could please you, speak. Could you please You're put on. your thumb up, Lou, if my sound is clear. It's clear. It's clear. Good. So, obviously, there are lots of issues in this field, but one that I'd like to focus on, particularly in the light of uh, the COVID pandemic and environmental issues and global warming issues, is the need to make sure we give a voice to what I call dissenting experts. So, if you think about COVID, for example, there was like the official experts, people like Anthony Fauci in the United States and others elsewhere, whose line the government took. There were also some crazy people who said it's all a world, new world order conspiracy. Well, we just ignore them. And then there were what I call dissenting experts, people who did know what they were talking about, who had professional expertise, but who said we should be doing something differently. I'm thinking particularly in the COVID case of people like the Great Barrington Group who said we should do focused protection rather than general lockdowns, or in global warming, people who say rather than trying to stop global warming, we should adapt to it and move to different places and do things in different ways. And I think it's very important to make sure we always actually listen to dissenting experts like that. Because there's a real danger, I think, in the new in the modern world that people will just say, oh, the official experts are right. And those themselves, if they don't get sufficiently challenged, will become smug, will not test their um, assumptions so carefully, and will perhaps um, end up with mistaken conclusions simply because they're not being challenged enough. Um, so that, I think, is an area of real concern. Uh, another area of concern is when we think about what get identified as specific threats to getting the right answers, this thing that gets called disinformation. Yes, of course, there are people around who say idiotic things, either deliberately or because they just don't have a clue what they're talking about. Again, there are all sorts of eccentrics who chimed in on COVID and eccentrics who chimed in on global warning, warming. But I think it's incredibly important that we never try to silence any voice even the crazy ones. And I am worried here that we've got in the United States this proposed Board of Disinformation, in the United Kingdom, the Online Safety Bill, which is supposed to um, put a stop to legal but harmful content being hosted by Facebook and Twitter and people like that. There's comparable things going on in the European Union. And I do think it's time to take a stand with the dissenting experts to make sure they actually get listened to and with the the fringe thinkers, however crazy, to make sure to, to make sure that we say no, we do not stop people saying it. I must say that I'm a great believer in the First Amendment standard. 
Well, thank so you very much for that. So, so am I. And it, on a good day, it still works. And long live Hyde Park Corner across the pond. And I hope you still have lunatics perorating from soapboxes up there because we do need free speech. That's my own belief. Let me let me uh, go to Nader al Bisri, professor of philosophy at the American University of Beirut. Uh, and uh, so, Nader, what is your view on, on this uh, speech issue? And uh, please, please give us uh, uh, some response uh, uh, in, in this uh, area. Uh, I, I agree uh, with the direction of what uh, Richard has articulated, but I also think that it is coming from a particular uh, outlook on uh, politics and how we deal with public affairs and the role of science in informing uh, uh, the debate in the public sphere and the legislation that supports this within uh, context that in their very constitutional fabric would uh, champion this idea of freedom of speech. But the reality is, as we know, in a, in a more uh, uh, global sense of how these uh, find their way of being manifested in actual practices differ according to cultures, religious contexts, uh, geographic locations, different political systems. And the very fact that we are entering into a territory at uh, after the pandemic that seems to be bent more on religiosity and on potential oppression that perhaps has taken advantage of the fact that we, during the lockdown, we have been pushed into alternative online virtual environments in which we generate a sense uh, or a semblance of public space while the reality of the police was left to be controlled within systems that ultimately might uh, introduce these directives that control uh, the mode in which uh, um, opinion and argument is being uh, disseminated and judged. And I think this intersects uh, with a, uh, an aspect that uh, I hope we'll be able to discuss a bit in, the, in this uh, panel, which is the role of technicity. And... Uh, in wide sense of what the future holds in terms of the unfolding of the essence of uh, modern technology. Okay, thank you very much for those introductory remarks, uh, Nader. And I, I think there, there's definitely a question here of, uh, of cultural relevance. Uh, India, uh, which is the site uh, technically of this meeting, is the world's largest democracy, surely one of the most pluralistic. So I hope our Indian friends are going to listen to some of the uh, problems that we have elsewhere in the world with this issue and where we uh, draw the line, if at all, on what kind of speech is permissible, what kind of speech perhaps isn't. And I know that Tina has something to say about this, so it's a perfect time to introduce her. She's a visiting scholar at Dartmouth College and also, I believe, on the West Coast at the moment. Are you still there? Okay, still Tina, here. so please uh, give us your thoughts on, on this first set of issues. Yeah, so I have a few thoughts, and um, I think the opening comments are sort of the standard uh, viewpoint of the intellectual left, uh, liberalism, freedom, freedom of, of thought at all costs. It's certainly um, the primary focus of um, the American intelligentsia, and I don't have a problem with that in and of itself. I don't have a problem with the prioritization of freedom and freedom of speech in particular. But I think the danger is that freedom can become a kind of a trope, a kind of a um, is that go ahead, <laughs> a kind of a um, um, an excuse um, to trample on on other priorities that should be important right. in, a, in a democracy and a civilized society. Thank and that, and, and most importantly, that is what I'm going to call, and I'm not the first to call it that, human dignity. And so I think what we need to, um, I think that um, in the United States, um, similar to what's happening on the world stage in, in some of the more, I would say, more civilized countries, um, is think about um, uh, John Stuart Mill's harm principle. And, and so, of course, he's the author of On Liberty and his conception of liberty. He documented that he documented the Western conception of liberty in On Liberty, although it had, it had been around for a while. But at the what people don't um, 
necessarily, I think, focus on enough is that part of the part of on liberty is the harm principle. And that is that liberty stops when harm begins. So in the United States, in terms of censorship of freedom of expression, or let's just say um, gent more gently, limitations on freedom of expression, um, there's not enough prioritization of human dignity. And what I mean by that is, while I agree that cancel culture is problematic, primarily because it violates due process, at the same time, I think that a healthy um, regulation of hate speech um, uh, in the United States um, would be helpful in sending a message to the world that we are on board with their approaches to hate speech, which is that it, the harm that it causes is so harmful that it justifies minimal, I'm not talking about drastic, but minimal limitations on freedom of speech. So I, I would advocate a regulation of hate speech, and I would use uh, European models as an example. Uh, en route to um, what I'm going to call hermeneutic dialogue. Okay, so that's the future of thought that I would advocate, hermeneutic dialogue. And what that means is placing conflicting viewpoints in dialogue. And it's similar to kind of a Hegelian fashion. Um, but the, um, the premises of hermeneutic dialogue are that there is no universal solution. OK, you can't find it. <laughs> but what you can do is put conflicting viewpoints in dialogue. The challenge is that there are power dynamics in those dialogues. And so we have to find a way, I think, to solve some of these world problems, war, et cetera, of uh, finding a neutral arbitrator, arbitrator to facilitate hermeneutic dialogue with the goal of finding the place where people's um, varied interests intersect rather than looking for a universal ideological solution, which I think is impossible. OK, I think that's a good place to halt this river of ideas that flows from you, Tina. I'm very glad that you mentioned John Stuart Mill. Uh, I am also a great admirer of On Liberty and the core principle being the harm principle. You know, the great uh, Oxford scholar Isaiah Berlin, founder of All Souls College, called that work the most ardent defense of liberty ever penned in the English language. And I think he was right. Uh, but the question of censorship and hate speech still looms over it and us. I must, uh, I'm, I can't refrain from saying to you that since you posited this kind of liberty as a traditional value of the left, I have been subject to censorship by the academic wing for 30 years, and it's all been from the left. All right, so let's put that in the balance, okay? Where the censorship is coming from today seems to me to be from the left. So that's a, a lesson for our Indian friends to contemplate as they go down that road. So pardon me for being excited about what you had to offer. I think we can now come from the West Coast to the East Coast and turn to Martin Butcher, who's professor of English and comparative literature at Harvard University. So, so that's a very broad canvas, Martin. I know that you're painting on and from your works and also. So please weigh in with your thoughts on this issue. Thank you very much, Lou, uh, and thank you all. It's great that the discussion has already started. Uh, I'm a lousy painter, but I, I do range widely. So, uh, and because of that, I think my main perspective on the issues we've been discussing is uh, a kind of cultural history perspective, I think, primarily. And from that perspective, uh, I think I'm close to Tina in that I think it's inevitable that the public expression of political ideas will always be contested in various ways. It will be contested by different, you know, cultural clashes, religious affiliations, struggle for recognition, another Hegelian idea, and dignity. I think, Tina, what you described as a quest for dignity and is, is something that Hegel captures very well in his idea for struggle of recognition. And I think that's something that hovers sometimes in a, it's acknowledged, sometimes not, uh, behind some of uh, today's debates. I think that this question of freedom of speech, I'd like to introduce a distinction made by Wendy Brown, where she distinguishes between freedom of speech and academic freedom. And, and I think it's a useful distinction because, because I think the freedom of speech is a political category. It has to do with censorship uh, of Public, uh, the public expression of political ideas. And that's 
an ideal I certainly believe in, and that's important and, and that we've been discussing. Different from that, I think, is academic freedom, which is more a principle that could be described as the ability of a scholar to choose a subject and to conduct classroom discussion without outside interference and create a atmosphere of an exchange of ideas that have to, however, be grounded in evidence that are sort of restricted by disciplinary boundaries that are much more embedded in an educational setting where it would, for example, be inadequate for someone to just make a sort of voice a political opinion out of left field or out of right field or out of any field in a classroom setting that has very little to do with the discussion, with the evidentiary standards of a field, and that's uh, that's presented there. So I think that's, uh, for me, that's a very useful distinction, certainly for the US con uh, context of, of that discussion between freedom of speech in the political realm and the, and the kind of political democratic ideals underpinning that, and the more narrow, if you will, this discussion right now in the university setting about how universities can become places for vigorous exchange of ideas, but in a university and therefore disciplinary and evidentiary based context. It's a narrower and more constricted view of that. So I'll just offer that as a distinction, a political speech, freedom of expression in the political realm and uh, uh, academic freedom. That's a very important distinction, Martin, and, and thank you so much for raising it. I mean, we have in the U.S., and maybe our Indian friends uh, could take note of this, uh, that we do have a distinction as well between the private and public sectors and the Bill of Rights, of course, uh, is tenable only in the public sector. So a private university need not uphold the First Amendment in the same way as a public university. Uh, you teaching at Harvard would know this. Uh, I teach at City College, which is public. So in theory... Uh, we are freer to speak, but not necessarily in practice for reasons that you've hinted at. So that that's a very, very important distinction. So Nuno, you've been listening now. Nuno is a professor of philosophy at Nova University in Portugal, and he's been listening to, to the debate about this being based in the USA and the Middle East and, and the UK. How, how does it look from Iberia, Nuno? Please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself, Nuno. Yes. Thank you, Lou. Um, well, we definitely face a set of uh, new uh, challenges uh, in the post-truth world we live in today. Um, Europe, in particular, has taken democratic values uh, for granted uh, as if the rest of the world would necessarily recognize them. But this was too optimistic a view. Even in Europe, uh, we see the re-emergence of the extreme right, but also the rise of the radical left. Uh, paradoxically enough, they depend on each other uh, for survival. Extremist or radical political views are a threat to, to the democratic system, but sometimes it seems uh, that the political center is gone, at least here in Europe. I think we are really in danger of restricting what we may discuss if we fail to recentering politics. Recentering means, uh, first and foremost, to put democracy at the very center of the political uh, agenda. It's, it is intolerable that the new dictators and authoritarian regimes around the world demand that we accept their flawed narratives. We simply cannot normalize brutal aggressions. But we should also be cautious about minor aggressions, so to speak, such as censorship and other restrictions to free speech. So what can be the role of philosophy in this strange world? Well, philosophy has always been key uh, to the process of uh, opening people's minds to think freely and orient themselves to reason. Uh, even in the face of geopolitical stress. In an era of global communication, 
philosophy needs to teach how important it is to make use of rational arguments to expose fallacious narratives that may have been propagated through certain media. This requires an exercise of continuous independent reasoning that is uh, epistemological informed. Among current epistemological views, I work in epistemology, so uh, virtue epistemology, which points out the importance of our intellectual virtues for the pursuit of knowledge, looks like the most promising way to achieve such an end. We can discuss this later. And, well, maybe I'm an old school, but I'm convinced that the best fact-checking tool is your own reason. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much. You know, you know that I sympathize. We've worked together before and always collaboratively, so maybe because we share certain core views, uh, one has to be impressed by the advances of science and technology, and we're all captive to them at the moment. Nonetheless, the emphasis uh, or perhaps overemphasis on STEM has impoverished the study of humanities of late. And in fact, many humanities, you're all nodding because you know that humanities departments are under siege. And this is clearly a false dichotomy. We have many science students who are no longer learning critical thinking, and that's inimical to their ability surely to function as scientists uh, because philosophy reaches across all disciplines, arguably, uh, and, and furthers uh, this great power of the human mind to which more than one of you has alluded. All right, let's have a round now where we look at the so-called new normal, uh, how epistemology f figures into this, how technology figures into this. Is there a new normal or are we going to be in a continuous crisis because it's been very useful perhaps uh, for certain interests to maintain us there? So we'll come back now to, to Richard. I know you also have a, a, a philosophy cafe in Cambridge, right? And you're dealing with epistemology, but you don't seem to be hearing me, Richard. I'm so sorry. Are, are you able to unmute and, and speak? I think not. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Richard is, uh, has a connection that's not permitting him at this point to actually participate um, so I'm going to move to, to Nader. I know you have some important things to share with us concerning technology and its influence on humanity. Would you give us a brief a synopsis, please, of the new normal in light of all of this technology? Um, actually, this adds a bit to, the, to this focus on epistemology that uh, uh, particularly uh, Nuno has highlighted. But I want to push it a bit further in relationship to the advancement in technicity uh, on, in multiple spheres, but in particular in the way the dominant uh, mainstream currents now in philosophy, especially when they are tackling issues that uh, relate to uh, knowledge, cognition, and the way we account for human experience and even language, seem to be in the shadow of the exact sciences, which means that ultimately uh, what apportions and measures the validity of reasoning is in the, in the way it uh, reflects advancement in technoscience. And we could take, for instance, uh, philosophy of mind and how it becomes a sort of a footnote almost to what is being conducted in neuroscience or even philosophy of language, which have, has now been faced with the challenge of uh, dealing with the complexities and the developments of li linguistics or logic, taking into account computational, probabilistic kind of uh, 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 mathematized directions that no longer can retain uh, the mode of reasoning uh, encapsulated within the domain of handling logos. Uh, so uh, these challenges by themselves push us also into a ontological kind of stress, meaning that um, we are at the cusp of changes that we haven't yet fathomed the extent in which they will impinge not on our lifestyle, on freedom, on our politics or uh, intersubjective relations, but they will alter even processes of our cognition, uh, sense of identity, the deprivation of the, the genuineness of the physical uh, multisensorial experience in the flesh, 
in, in the way it will be transformed in, in realms that are more online, virtual, or the capabilities that we have for biophysics that could alter the very fabric of what makes us who we are as living beings. And what holds us back is still a form of theory of value, an appendage of ethics, religion, uh, legislation that can be altered. And perhaps um, we can't we can't foresee what uh, what this would entail in terms of splintering the human condition into areas that would become much more controlled by uh, oligarchs that are technocrats and uh, regions that will be left uh, way behind and uh, in circumstances that cannot catch up with the uh, new impetus in technicity. So that's what I wanted to, you know, just throw as as elements for, for further discussion. That, that's a very rich set of, of ideas, Nadar. You, you have a gift for saying a lot in a, in a few words, uh, unlike most philosophers who need a lot of words to say a little. Uh, but seriously, we are, we are living in the age of the algorithm. And so this also displaces reasoning. And the algorithms are changing even as we're discussing them. And they are governing our lives. People are using apps to run their lives. And so there's this whole sense of, as you say, displacement. We've noticed that children are failing when they've been forced to learn online because of the sensory deprivation. We are embodied beings and we need to function in this way. So you've raised, this is very rich. uh, and, And surely there has to be some pushback of humanistic interaction that engages the technocrats. Maybe we need to send them away for a weekend of literature, poetry, music, and art to re-engage them with their own aesthetic tastes. Okay, I think that's a food for for many panels now, Derek. Thank you so much. Nina, uh, Tina, sorry, N- Tina, I know you, you have a response to this as well. So, so please tell us uh, what you see as, uh, as the new normal in light of the, of the problems that we're currently facing. Um, I'm not sure what I see as the new normal. I'm not sure that I have thoughts on uh, a way to characterize what that is to capture the moment. But I do have some um, responsive thoughts to the ideas that have been posited so far on this topic. And that is that while I share, as all philosophers do, um, a, a, a more than healthy respect for reason and rational argument, I kind of feel like it's my place to be the voice of the critique of reason here. <laughs> and and uh, so I, I don't want to bring out, uh, I don't want to upset you, Lou, but I'm going to bring up Foucault. <laughs> We are talking about epistemology and we are talking about knowledge and we are talking about what counts as legitimate knowledge. And I think it's true that in the technological space, which is the focus of what we're talking about, um, there are the challenges that you all have articulated. Um, They're all legitimate. But I think at the same time, um, technology has allowed a voice for the oppressed that hasn't been there in the past. Now, it may be erratic, it may be crazy, it may be extremist, but, you know, by your own arguments, many of you have argued in favor of getting even the most insane view out there on the table. But what I, I'm not, I don't think I would argue that, but what I would argue is that we need to find a way to provide a platform for the voices of the oppressed. And so the voices of the oppressed need to be a part of the dialogue and technology has allowed them to do that. I mean, now it's true, it's allowed crazy factions to develop, and that's problematic. But the flip side of that coin is it's allowed us to see murder uh, uh, in the United States uh, as representative of the kind of thing that can happen when the viewpoints of marginalized populations are not a part of the everyday conversation. So technology in the past year in the aftermath of COVID allowed the United States to engage in a real conversation about its sort of crazy uncle in the closet, racism, (laughs) okay, and to have a legitimate conversation about that. So um, this is can be couched um, on a more abstract level in terms of a kind of a uh, a plea for um, acknowledging kind of kind of the the, um, positive aspects of standpoint epistemology um, and um, and, and I'm going to bring in Mill once again, 
<laughs> um, because uh, I like him because he is, as I said, the best. Uh, he captured the kind of Western sense of freedom that we all respect and admire. Um, but at the same time, in On Liberty, there is much about how the voices of the oppressed in the United States are being silenced. And he, I think he even mentions black people. I don't remember specifically. So, um, uh, and so I want to say, and finally, I want to say that although this proliferation of extreme voices that the internet has facilitated um, can be understood as kind of the world gone mad, at the same time, I feel like it's helped us to engage in dialogues about silenced conversations that needed to be had. And we can't move forward and produce change without putting those um, repressed but popular viewpoints into dialogue. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mill and Foucault, is, uh, that's a heady brew, and I am more of a Francophile than you may realize. Okay. I, I, my students love debating Hobbes versus Rousseau on human nature, <laughs> okay. uh, which takes us, you know, into, yeah. into, into, into French Marx. thought and postmodernism, <laughs> too. So it's all important for the formation of the human mind. Surely we don't want to be dictating one point of view. I'm more sympathetic than, than you may think, but not to all of what you said. However, Martin, uh, you, you again are painting with this broad brush. So tell us about your view of the new normal, please. Yeah, well, I, I bring a, as always, my mind runs to history here. And so I would agree with what, uh, what what just been discussed, what Tina just said, from a historical perspective, because when I look at what what we are going through here from a media history perspective, I would say the cacophony of voices and opinions on the internet pales in comparison of what happened after Gutenberg. I mean, the the kind of things that were printed in newspapers and you know our idea of a kind of neutral fact-checked journalism is an extremely recent phenomenon. And so media revolutions always scramble uh, you know, systems of power and authority and institutions uh, that that control access to opinions. And so we are clearly going through another one of those phases. And so we've done that before and come out at the other end. So I don't think this is the end of civilization. Well, uh, I hope you're right. Uh, <laughs> but as Santayana said, people who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So perhaps we, we, we have to go back to that historical episode of Gutenberg and, and, and the flowering, you know, that took yeah, place. Definitely. True. But, you know, I want to just add one more thought, Lou, if I if I have the time, and that has to do with the new in the new normal that, you know, we are here, we're thinking about future. And I think immediately our mind run, minds run to new, what's new. And I think that I want to put some pressure on that, because I think that's in part a mode of thinking that's driven by technology and technological in innovation and the expectation that we'll have the next update and the next innovation and that we can engineer our way out of all kinds of problems. And I think that's deeply mistaken because all the things that you've mentioned, Lou, and that we've been discussing from the Ukraine war to all these problems, they can't engineer our way out of those with some new invention, with some new idea or some new technology. These are age old problems having to do with things that we've been dis discussing, cultural identity clashes in viewpoints, uh, uh, religious strife, all of these things. And so this is, I think, where the humanities and especially the more historically thinking humanities, which I'm supposed here representing, this is what we know. And so I think because we can see that in patterns, well, you know, this is what humans have been going through these clashes. And so there's nothing really new about that. And I think that's where I would start our, whether it's new thinking or old thinking, needs to think much more about the deep cultural history of human communication and collective thought and the splintering of humans. All of this has happened over and over again. And I think... So a real historical perspective on that is, to my mind, the most important antidote to the kind of technological, technologically driven thinking that suggests that we are just on the cusp of an engineering problem to these old problems.
Wonderful. I mean, in the sense that you've articulated something really important. You may recall Garrett Hardin having said this in his landmark paper, The Tragedy of the Commons, back to 68, when he said there's no technological solution to this problem. It has to be a moral solution. And so so you've you've said a lot. Basically, you're pitching, I think, an important notion that 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 a lot of scientists, a lot of technology students need to be taking humanistic courses from all of us. What a team we would make. Nuno, your thoughts on this, please. Well, well, per- perhaps I take the new normal in a different sense. Um, I see the new normal as the, uh, as the challenge we face to adapt to new circumstances that were uh, enforcing, uh, of course, covid and uh, and the way we now uh, live um, well, after the pandemic or still in the middle of the pandemic, I don't know how to characterize it. But um, anyway, um, so the the ways we need to to adapt to to these new circumstances. But for example, the ecological problem. So twenty thirty years ago, this was more or less. Uh, hidden from, from us. Um, at least it was not in our agenda. It was not in our um, in our day-to-day uh, lives. And now we have to cope with this uh, extraordinary difficult problem. Um, so um, I, I think the new normal requires some uh, some measures from us to to take, and uh, and that's why I was uh, calling into into the field epistemology, of course. I agree with Tina that perhaps philosophy in general has been uh, too much heretical and definitely we we cannot uh, put philosophy uh, in the service of the communities uh, when philosophy is simply done at um, at universities offices this, this is clear so uh, philosophy needs to to be practical and Lou has been one of my favorite practical philosophers in the in the previous year, so uh, uh, he knows uh, how uh, how to direct philosophy towards the the community, towards the public, and of course there are many ways uh, of doing this. And uh, and I, I think that so I, uh, just coming back to to Tina because she said lots of things that make sense to me, and uh, it's important, of course, to to realize how the the oppressed have now. Uh, a voice through the new technologies. Um, the the problems uh, I see are not, of course, the 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 possibility of expressing their their views, even if uh, uh, if mistaken. Um, the problem I see is the is the attempt to take advantage by some politicians uh, of uh, of these media and uh, and of perhaps uninformed people. Uh, in order just to to get political advantages, uh, and that's that's where I think that uh, well, an informed perspective, a uh, reasoned perspective, can uh, can have a place, and uh, and then uh, philosophy can certainly help in this in this regard. Thank you very much, Richard. Are you able to unmute and 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 offer your thoughts? I'm not sure if you're uh, able to do this, but if so, please unmute yourself. It doesn't seem quite possible at this moment. I'm I'm very sorry. Um, we have uh, only seven minutes remaining. You know, the panels normally, uh, the old normal w- w- was an hour and a half. The new normal is 45 minutes, which is far too brief for a panel uh, so distinguished as yourselves. We also have audience uh, participation, and I'm not going to have time to call on everyone, but Robert Kahn is another person whom I know from many meetings. Uh, Robert, do you have a question for the panel that you could pose in one minute, and then we'll give everyone a chance to, to respond to you? That might be a good way to wrap this up. Are you, are you there, Robert? Would you like to, to pose a question? Do I think... Um... I, I've given him the mic. Richard unmuted himself. Oh, Richard. I'm sorry, Robert. Richard, would Hello? you like to give us your, your response to what we've been talking about, please? please go to Richard. Do you want me to say something? Yes. Mm-hmm. We, we would love you to say something. Ah, so, so, 
Sorry, I've had a lot of problem with the incoming sound, so I'm not sure whether I can respond sensibly. I've heard a fragment of what other people have said. Um, I do agree with, I think, something that Tina was saying, that um, there's a problem with those who don't have a voice and with free speech potentially sliding into hate speech and causing real harm. I think there it's important to say um, you know, hate speech speech that distorts history, misinformation, they're all definitely bad things and we should not hesitate to condemn them and say that is unethical. And maybe we can do that and without effectively enough not to feel any temptation to make a law against it, to retreat from what is in the US, the First Amendment standard, which is a standard I would like to see everywhere. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. I'm sorry you're having technical problems, but we'll welcome you back on a future panel and hear more from you, I hope, Richard. Uh, very nice to see you, Robert. Would you like to unmute and, and in very short order, give us a question or a comment? Yeah. Um, hey, Lou, great to see you. It was a very good discussion. I missed part of it because I had to take a business call, so sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> but the discussion you're having is with some very bright inform people who have an academic grounding. Uh, so you guys can have a discussion where you disagree and, and, and bring to it fact-based uh, you know, uh, approach. How, how do we expand that to the general population, which seems so lacking in the grounding that you all have? And I'll go back and mute and listen. Wonderful question. This is a perfect note on, on, uh, on which we can not close this session, but temporarily call a halt to it. How can we spread this uh, generalized knowledge base so that others who are not academics and not philosophers can have an informed debate that is truly enriching? This is a great question, Robert, and I thank you for posing it. So let's go around. Uh, everyone can, can have about 30 seconds to respond to this impossible mission, but go ahead. Uh, Richard, please, if you're able to. I think Richard's still on some kind of time delay, so he'll get this in his earpiece tomorrow. All right, now, Nadir, please, we'll give you your, your, your time to respond, but very quickly as we're going to be cut off. So that it is something perhaps more concrete, even though it is face, it faces great difficulties, I think it is within higher education if we can restore some kind of proper commitment to something like liberal arts uh, curricula, especially for STEM subjects, and develop uh, a capacity to use language in an oratory that develops the hermeneutic dialogical uh, uh, space. Wonderful. Instead of teaching slogans and ideology, I, I, I think that's what you left unsaid. But thank yeah. you so much. For very thoughtful comments, Nadir. I've greatly enjoyed interacting with you. Uh, Tina, so your last thought, 30 seconds, please. Yeah. So all I would say is just uh, repeat uh, the idea that we need to get the idea of human dignity out as a priority that every person has human dignity and, and to keep that in mind when engaging in dialogue with another person, somehow get that idea out into the world as um, something that's valuable and legitimate. I don't know the exact method, sorry, the philosopher in me, but I think that that would, would help. I think it would help enormously, and I totally support that. But perhaps you realize it would also be the death knell of identity politics, which is absolutely dehumanizing and destructive. OK, if you want to value the individual person in terms of their character, then by all means, I'm on your team. Uh, Martin, please, your view on this. Sure. I, I don't know whether I have a direct answer, but I've been mulling over this question of the voices of the oppressed. And I, you know, on many levels, I completely agree with that. But I think on some level, one problem I see is that today everyone feels oppressed. You know, everyone feels like they're somehow, you know, in the minority. It's, I feel like people around this Zoom call uh, feel that. So this, to my mind, puts, we need to put some pressure on that category and maybe at first of all acknowledge that we all feel like oh if if there are not enough people like me who think like me around and i think that impulse let me convert everyone to my way of thinking i mean i i have it too but 
uh, I feel like we, we have to check that a little bit and maybe rethink this category even of the voices of the oppressed. Because, Thank you very uh, much. Thank you very much, Mark. We are all minorities of, of one at the end of the day, perhaps. Nuno, final thought briefly, please. Well, like Nader, I, uh, I think higher education is, is essential. And if possible, with philosophy, just give you an example. Uh, in Norway, all um, bachelor degrees have a semester of philosophy. They call it examum philosophicum. And so uh, if, even if you study uh, medicine or engineering or whatever, you, you have at least a semester of philosophy. It's a very broad general introduction to philosophy. I think this should be followed by all countries. Wonderful. And, and starting with the U.S., which has basically deconstructed all of that, there are more Americans now, probably 95 percent of Americans never encountered philosophy in their education and more is the pity. So I hope our Indian friends who inhabit the most ancient philosophical culture on the planet, probably, um, are not going to lose sight of their traditions. I hope they will learn from our mistakes. This has been such a great panel. I only wish we had more time. Robert, I hope you got some takeaway from, from this, but we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you again at a future Horasis event and hopefully having a, a, more, a more complex interaction with you, okay? Look forward to that, Lou. Thank you. And to everyone on the panel, thanks for a great job. Thank you so much. So again, you've done my job for me, Robert. This has been a great panel. I only wish we had much more time to, to listen to each of you. Thank you so much for your contributions. And I'll look forward to seeing you again at a future event. Okay, be well, everyone. Thanks to Frank Jürgen Richter for inviting us all to philosophize together. Okay, fantastic. Have a wonderful journey, my friends. Be well, be safe Cheers. until we meet again.